Okay, so everybody is very welcome to the Executive Office Committee meeting. Um, and as we're all on star leaf or in the room, I don't need to introduce who's here. Everybody can, can see each other now at this stage. Um, we do have apologies from um, Christopher Stalford um, at this stage. So that just leaves Trevor then, uh, but we don't have an apology from Trevor at this stage, but he's the only one that we, that we don't have. Um, yeah, but we can see uh, we have Emma, uh, Sharon, Pat Sheehan and George Robinson on Starleaf uh, video conference with us. Um, if we could start then with the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 17th of June, which is at page 5 of the meeting pack. Are members content that it's uh, an accurate minute of the meeting? Yep. Content. Okay, so sign those now so they don't forget to do it later. Okay, uh, there's no matters arising, which means that we can move to item four, which is the oral evidence session with the junior ministers on Brexit issues. Then, if we can get the junior ministers. Uh, so we'll let them get in. Go to page 10 of the meeting pack and page three of the tabled pack. There is some relevant um, information that's there, but we will. I can never start. navigate the two. No, the meeting packs on the. Yeah, no, it's I'm sure there is. I'm sure there's a, a, a way of doing this. It's a lot easier than. Very far away. Not move up. Okay. Thank you very much indeed to the junior ministers. You're very welcome. Um, we will. Uh, let you get settled in there. We have members that are on the screens at either side uh, that are participating via Starleaf. We have George, Pat and Emma that are there and um, there's the four of us in the room, although Trevor has just nipped out for a minute, but he'll be back in again. Um, so I want to thank you for coming along today to uh, give us this update and what we will do is pass over to yourselves and let you give us a presentation and then we'll take questions after that. So, Declan, are you going to kick off for us? Yes, Colin. Thank you. Thanks very much everybody for allowing us to come in this afternoon and, uh, and provide you with this update. So I'll commence. Colin, yes, sure. and then Gordon uh, will also share uh, additional information with yourself. So uh, we did undertake originally at the last meeting and since to interact as fully as possible with the, the committee. And we last briefed you on the 13th of May and then uh, officials provided an update on Brexit on the 27th. And we are resolved to ensuring that we continue to providing the committee with oral briefings on Brexit on a monthly basis. I think we're going to try and arrange uh, for a routine date at the end of each month from this point on. The joint heads of government will attend the committee next week and they'll provide an update on broader departmental and COVID related issues. And you have received a briefing paper ahead of today's meeting. So we intend, Colin, to update you on progress made over the last few weeks on a variety of EU exit issues. The committee was aware that during uh, the COVID-19 response phase, EU exit matters were being considered at routine executive meetings. And we have recently uh, resumed meeting as an executive committee dealing with EU exit matters to ensure that there's an appropriate focus on all of those issues. So I'm going to start uh, by providing an update on the negotiations and the joint and the specialised committee meetings following our last committee appearance. Negotiations on the future relationship between the British Government and the EU have been ongoing, and the fourth uh, formal negotiating round concluded on the 5th of June. You'll know uh, from the statements on both sides that significant areas of divergence remain, and specifically and we touched on this at our last uh, hearing session. These relate to governance, open and fair competition, thirdly fisheries and also internal security. The high level stock take meeting, again which we indicated to you at the last meeting, uh, between the British Prime Minister and the President of the Commission 
Ursula von der Leyen and the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, took place then on the 15th of June. And following the meeting, the British Government and the EU have committed to intensify a negotiation process with a view to trying to arrive at a deal as soon as possible. Negotiators will now continue during the months of July and August uh, to meet, and subject to public health considerations, it is expected that there would be a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting in London and also in Brussels in all likelihood in uh, September. And that would represent a quite significant increase in the tempo and pace of engagement. I'm sure that we're all in agreement that it's in everybody's interests that certainty is provided for our society and all of our local businesses. And throughout this next stage, we will of course be taking every opportunity to continue to engage with the British Government to ensure that the future relationship best reflects the interests of our citizens, businesses and wider community and economy. So I'll now turn to uh, provide an update on the Joint Committee and the Specialised Committees themselves. The second meeting of the Joint Committee on the Withdrawal Agreement took place uh, on Friday the 12th of June, uh, three days before the high-level meeting I mentioned earlier. The meeting was jointly chaired by the Chancellor for the Duchy of Lancaster, Michael Gove, and also European Commission Vice President Maros Sefakovic. A copy of the agenda for that meeting was provided to the committee. That meeting was joined by Michel Barnier, the European Commission's chief negotiator, who is also the alternate EU chair of the joint committee, as well as representatives from uh, 15 member states, and that also included Ireland. The joint heads of government, uh, Junior Minister Lyons and myself, took part in the meeting, supported by the Director General for and international relations, Andrew McCormick. That committee meeting received an update on progress on the implementation of the withdrawal agreement from both the British government and the EU sides, as well as updates from the six specialised committees, including that on Ireland and the ENI specialised committee. On behalf of the executive, we outlined that our officials are continuing to work closely with the British government colleagues to ensure fulfilment of the obligations under the withdrawal agreement and that all relevant processes would be in place and concluded by the 31st of December 2020. And that relates particularly to those areas which are under the specific responsibility of our power sharing government. Regarding the implementation of agri-food requirements, we indicated that officials in DERA are engaging with their counterparts in the British Government and working towards ensuring that appropriate measures are put in place to facilitate the movement of goods and products between Britain and the North, and also to minimise the burden on business whilst complying with the statutory requirements set out in the protocol. DERA officials are also focused on protecting the safety and security of the North agri-food industry and associated supply chain post-transition. We also made clear that we wanted to see streamlining of documentation and low percentages for physical checks, and we've requested that all sides recognise the need for flexibility within application of the protocol in all of those respects. The Joint Committee also officially received notification from the British Government that it would not request an extension of the transition period at that meeting. A request uh, was required to be made by the 1st of July, and therefore the second meeting of the Joint Committee was the last opportunity to do that, and that position was then reaffirmed at the high-level meeting three days later. The EU acknowledged that decision, but has indicated that it would remain open to accommodating an extension request in the coming weeks, should the British Government decide otherwise. During the meeting, we also updated the Committee on the progress the Executive has made in relation to the single electricity market. We recognise that there are significant legislative requirements that have, had, that have to be delivered during the transition period, which will be required for operation of the single electricity electricity market under the terms of the protocol. Further, we stated 
that while the importance of the single electricity market has been acknowledged by both the British Government and the EU, clarity is still required around the following issues. And these include the efficiency of trading between the single electricity market and British markets, and how our views would be taken into consideration with regards to the future operation of the single electricity market on the relevant European bodies. The opportunity was then taken to reaffirm to the committee that it is important that all of our views are properly adequately taken into account as this process moves forward. And the next meeting of the Joint Committee is scheduled for a date in September. So I'll hand over now to Gordon. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to cover the uh, Northern Ireland Ireland Protocol readiness for the end of the EU transition period, uh, which will include an update on legislation and common frameworks. So the committee will be aware of the publication of the command paper on the protocol um, by uh, Her Majesty's Government on the 20th of May. We remain committed to working with our colleagues uh, in HMG to ensure that all of these objectives are achieved in a way that secures the best possible outcome for our citizens uh, and businesses, um, in a way that is beneficial to uh, our economy and ensures the smoothest possible flow of trade in all directions. Some elements of the delivery and implementation of the protocol, for example the agri-food requirements, fall within the executive's devolved competence and the executive has committed uh, to working with uh, HMG to ensure that obligations are met. However, we will also ensure that the UK government honours its commitments. Uh, it is important that any implementation is done in a light touch way, uh, taking account of the commitment by the UK and the EU um, in the protocol to use uh, all endeavours um, and, and best endeavours to minimise uh, friction. We also welcome um, the government's commitment in the command paper to engage with Northern Ireland businesses to discuss their proposals and provide feedback on how to maximise the free flow uh, of trade. Minister Kearney and I attended the first of these meetings with representatives from our business community on the 10th of June. It is clear to us that a high level of engagement needs to be maintained over the next few months if businesses are to have the necessary clarity and appropriate support to prepare for the end of the transition period. So in terms of operational readiness, following the confirmation from HMG that it would not be requesting an extension to the transition period, the executive recently agreed that there was a need for Northern Ireland departments to commence work on readiness um, for the end of the transition period. And while there are still several possible scenarios for the end of the transition period, the one scenario which remains static is that of a non-negotiated outcome. The executive has therefore agreed that our readiness planning should commence to include the potential of a non-negotiated outcome scenario. This would provide a baseline for readiness, but we'll need to allow planning to be flexible and adapt as and when clarity emerges um, through the negotiations. Officials are continuing to liaise and work with the Northern Ireland Office and other government departments and with their counterparts in the Irish government to seek the necessary clarity on protocol issues to support our readiness for the end of the transition period. In terms of legislation, legislation is a key area in preparing for both the implementation of the protocol and the future relationship, uh, or in the event of a non-negotiated outcome for operational preparedness. We have a significant challenge ahead of us to affect a high volume of largely technical EU exit legislation before the end of the transition period on the 31st of December 2020. Work is ongoing to capture the volume of legislation which is likely to be required and it will be necessary to manage this alongside the essential mainstream business of the Assembly, including the non-EU exit legislative programme. So our officials are liaising with the Assembly to ensure that Assembly committees are involved in a timely an appropriate manner in progressing the legislation, but you'll be glad to hear that the Executive Office has not identified any legislation to be brought forward under the EU exit legislation programme. Um, so that means there will not be too much of your time, Mr Chairman, being taken up uh, in, in the Assembly. Finally, in regards to common frameworks, at the Executive meeting on the 15th of June, the Executive agreed to endorse the common frameworks principles 
which had been agreed at JMCEN in October 2017, and this decision will be communicated to the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. Now, it has been recognised that there are significant challenges in having a full suite of common frameworks in place by the end of the transition period, and interim arrangements have also been agreed by the Executive to deliver core elements of the Common Frameworks project by the end of the year. As a result, 10 high-priority frameworks have been identified as essential for delivery, and a letter will also be sent to the Assembly setting out the revised arrangements and expected Assembly scrutiny. I hope, <coughs> Mr <coughs> Chairman, that these updates have been useful. Um, no doubt you will have a few extra questions, and we are, of course, happy to take them. Okay, thank you very much to the ministers for the uh, questions um, or for the presentation. And yep, we'll move on and ask a, a few questions. Um, maybe if I could start the terms of reference for the executive committee uh, considering EU exit matters were placed in the assembly library last week, but they weren't provided to the committee. Um, us being the committee that is charged with scrutinising this area of work. The terms of reference for the original subcommittee weren't provided to this committee either. That was apparently due to a clerical oversight. Was this another clerical oversight? Because we're racking up quite a number of them. Let's ensure that that problem is remedied. Uh, we'll ensure this afternoon that... Uh, that that situation is regularised, Colin. I, 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 don't, I don't have a, an explanation. I'm sure Gordon doesn't either. It may be an administrative oversight. If it is, uh, it's an, an administrative oversight which should not have been made. So in, in the spirit of our intention to engage with you on a regular basis and to provide as much information as possible, uh, let us try and fix that omission and ensure that the relevant terms of reference are circulated to the committee uh, within the next 24 hours. Okay, that would be appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, in those original terms of reference, the subcommittee had a focus on agreeing a, a policy position, and that has changed now to agreeing a common policy position. Is there any significance in the insertion of that word common, um, or is that just simply a drafting matter? Um, I, I don't know the exact answer to that. I would assume that it's just a, a drafting matter. I don't think that, that it changes substantially the, the, the point that, that we're trying to make in terms of coming towards uh, an, an agreed position, Mr Chairman. Okay, so there's still the same approach in the, same, <coughs> uh, in, in the subcommittee to try and, and reach consensus? Absolutely, and that's not just for EU exit-related matters either as an executive since we were established on the 11th of January. That has been pre uh, approached to always seek a consensus uh, wh where we can and uh, especially so um, as we go into the future, we're still, we're still committed to that. We've, we've shared uh, with you the, uh, the common framework priorities. That's a joint executive position. Uh, the negotiation priorities that the, uh, the executive put in place some time back, they remain in place. And those are common positions shared by all executive ministers and the power sharing government. Of course, there are differences and we touched on that. Uh, at our last hearing in relation to matters relating to ex uh, extension of the transition period. But fundamentally, uh, what the executive is committed to doing is developing a strategic roadmap that serves the best interests of all of the citizens living in the North. Okay, um, could you give us a little more impact or detail on the assessments that are underway for the Brexit impact on the sort of North, South and East, West institutions? Um, and some of that would have been referenced in the NDNA. I mean, what, what preparations are there to, to try and look at, at the impact that Brexit is going to have on those institutions? Well, um, you mean in terms of North South bodies and the British Irish Council and the, the East West yeah, bodies? Yeah, there, there's well. North South East West institutions. Obviously, they'll reflect the change come Brexit. Uh, you know, so what, what sort of uh, has there been a, an assessment done of the impact that there will be on those institutions and how they operate and how they deliver, um, given that they will be in a new dispensation uh, potentially in January? Well, look, obviously it's a requirement that they, that they are still going to uh, take place. They've, they've been around for a long time and will continue to do. Um, I think that they are, they'll continue to be important as we, as we move into our um, future outside of the, the, the European Union. 
that that's going to continue, and I, I don't see why that would that would change um, in any way, um, Mr. Chairman. If anything, it will give us um, additional ways in which we can communicate with other devolved administrations and and, and with our neighbours in the Republic of Ireland. I think it was a specific requirement in NDNA that there would, that assessment would take place. So has there been a formal process to to actually check out that that you know if that's going to take place, or is that something that's lined up for? No, that that examine that examination because I think that's the phrase. Uh, is to be commissioned because there will be implications uh, and then clearly in terms and we discussed this yesterday actually uh, in, a, in a separate issue in the assembly uh, if you take for example the uh, the issue of EU funding and you take the peace plus plus program then uh, there is a need for that to be addressed in the context of the uh, the, the NSMC, but specifically in relation to the SEUPB, what we have said is that uh, in relation to how the British government would address that issue in the negotiations going forward, specifically on Peace Plus, that there is a need for a, a trilateral engagement between the British government negotiators, the Irish government, and also uh, our own officials and the executive to ensure that our requirements under Peace Plus are properly provided for. Um, I'm just we're having a small connection failure at the front. Can I just check that the people that are on Starleaf that are video conferencing in, are you still hearing and seeing everything okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's Grant, that's fine. Um, okay, so um, I, I'll finish with three easy questions and now a difficult question. Um, just, you mentioned about the, um, that the British government has said basically it's not going to seek an extension. The EU um, is obviously said that it's open to an extension. I mean, what is your assessment in terms of the deadline that we would be at? You know, when when is the last chance saloon to actually ask for that extension? And then, how have has the Northern Ireland executive been articul you know, articulated or suggesting or requesting or asking for an extension? Or is the official position that you don't ask for it? How, how does that actually? Um, how is that processed or progressed at any of the meetings that you're at, or um, you know any of the even discussions that you would have just with UK officials? Are you saying this is what we would like? Or are you saying that this is something you wouldn't like? Or are you saying it's something that you can't agree on? H how is that actually put forward? You'll be aware, Mr. Chairman, that the executive hasn't reached an agreed position uh, on this issue, so we we don't communicate um, a position when we obviously don't have. Uh, an agreed one in relation to this issue. No doubt there are different, as you'll be aware, different political parties within the executive take a different view or a different approach uh, on this issue. Um, for my own part, I think we've got to the point now where a transition is, is, is out of the question. The, the British government have made it very, very clear um, where they stand uh, on that at, at this point in time. It is up to them to request uh, an extension and government ministers have, have stated that, that that is not something that they intend to do. That was discussed um, at, at two of the meetings that we were, we were at in, in June time. I think that the um, European Union has um, acknowledged that, have, have accepted that, um, and I think everybody's proceed, proceeding on that basis. I mean, do, do you articulate that you can't agree a position or do you not articulate anything yes. because you can't agree a position? Yes. Because uh, obviously that relays a particular... If you're actually saying we can't agree a position, it suggests, OK, that there may be a difference of opinion and there may be an acknowledgement that within the politics of the North that because it is two sides that are coming together, that if you aren't able to articulate a position, that there may be a difference of opinion, there may be a substantive viewpoint, maybe not a majority viewpoint, but a substantive viewpoint that would be differing and therefore you can't reach an opinion? Or does it just simply be because the executive can't form an opinion, it doesn't say anything? As Gordon stated, the political reality is that there is a, 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 a political difference of opinion, not only in relation to uh, the matter of withdrawal from Europe, but on the specific issue of an extension to the, the transition. So when Michael Gove uh, met with us prior to the joint committee meeting to advise that uh, the British government would be advising the EU, the European Commission, that it would not seek an extension to the uh, transition period, that meeting was attended by myself and uh, the First Minister. And, uh, and 
we made it clear that we do have a difference of opinion on this issue. Uh, uh, so the British government is very well cited on that fact. So when the joint committee meeting took place, Michael Gove set out the British government <coughs> position. I had asked that he make clear uh, as the lead British government minister that while that was the position of his government, it did not reflect uh, the, uh, the unanimous position of, of our executive. He did that, but uh, during the meeting, uh, the other joint head of government, Michelle O'Neill, did make clear that uh, outside the context of the executive, because there is not a unified position, and she, she explained that that was the case to Maros Sevakovic. She also did dissociate uh, our, my own party in, in party political terms, and also those other parties which have clearly expressed a view that we need an extension to the transition period. So I think everyone involved in these negotiations is very clear about the political difference that exists, that the executive has not been able to form a unanimous position around extension. But to be uh, clear on your specific question, is that articulated? Yes, but ultimately, as Gordon said, it is the British government that is in charge of this negotiation. Therefore, the British government is going to represent its position uh, directly to the EU. The, the British government position uh, diverged from, diverges from that of the, the Scottish and the Welsh administrations, uh, and they also recorded uh, their discontent at the decision that was reflected at the, the joint committee meeting for the record. So within the context of our exceptional political arrangements here, yes, there's a political difference of opinion. Do other players in the negotiations know that that is the case? Yes. And in terms of uh, that impacting on the uh, British government negotiation position, well, in many, re in many regards, they are lead. They have the uh, chief and principal authority. We will do our best to try and influence that to the greatest extent possible in the interests of local businesses, uh, our economy, and citizens living here in the north. Okay. Yeah. It's like two and a half of the devolved regions. Governments are basically saying go for an extension, but they're just the British government has taken its own particular view on that. And okay, do you share the? Um, well, the junior minister's perspective that we, we've gone beyond the, the stage of being able to ask for. I mean, the EU are saying that they're open to an extension. Is it still something that could be a potential, or do you feel, is it your assessment, that we've gone beyond the stage of asking for that? I think in terms of the real politic, uh, the, the British government telegraphed its intention not to seek an extension. It then proceeded to the joint committee meeting and formally registered that it would not be seeking uh, an extension. That suggests to me that the British government has a settled view on the issue of no extension to the transition period. But in the context of negotiations, as you'll appreciate, you know, there's many as a slip between cup and lip, and, and it's never over until it's over, if you'll forgive the mixing of metaphors. Therefore, the EU, the European Commission did, and I think in, in the spirit of collegiality and a desire to work as closely as possible to close out differences with the British government in order that we had maximum consensus, it did say that it was still prepared to keep a window open. So whilst that window remains open, then I, I think there is always potential scope. That said, and I would echo what I did uh, share with the committee at our, at our last meeting. The clock is ticking. We did tell you that the joint committee meeting would be a watershed moment, that it would be followed by the high-level meeting, so described, that that was a watershed moment indicating six to, seven month, six to seven months out from the conclusion of the transition period, and we're, we are now beyond that point. So we are moving rapidly closer towards the end of the year and the end of the transition. But I would never give up on the possibility that we might be able to influence an extension. Okay. Thank you for, for my question. I'm going to pass the Deputy Chair to Doug. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, 
Declan, Gordon, thank you um, for, for, your, for your evidence. I, I thought it was really clear. I think your answers have been really, really, really clear and really, really helpful, actually. Uh, and I think you articulated well, Declan, the, the issue about the, the extension. I think you, you've painted a very clear picture for me exactly where uh, we stand, because the, the reality is we, we have a unique system of, of government um, with, with different parties in it, uh, and where you can't get a single piece of ground to stand on in regards to an extension, neither could this committee. You know, so it's just a reality of politics, you know, in regards to that. But uh, I mean, I'm still looking at this, um, taking if I can, uh, that we're still looking at the 1st of July as being that window that we're talking about. So when you say a window, that window closes on the 1st of July. That's what I'm sensing it, uh, anyway. But could I ask you, and again, it's a sensing question, just to try and get a sense of, of the, the wider scope of that. Um, and I'm trying to figure out where there is real difference, and I'm not trying to pick out friction for the sake of picking out friction, but just a, a difference of where people see one thing and somebody sees something else. I, I mean, you may have seen Sammy Wilson's question in the House of Commons. I thought it was an interesting question about the Port of Larne receiving an email saying uh, it's going to be a border control post and uh, the, the Prime Minister saying, no, there'll be no new uh, infrastructure. Is, is that similarly a friction at the minute within the executive in regards to that? What's your sense of that question that Sammy Wilson asked and, and what the answer that was given by the Prime Minister? Well, you know, we've, we've just spoken about some of the differences that exist um, yeah. in terms of the transition period, but, you know, I think it's very clear that for everyone around the executive table, what we want to do is ensure the best outcome for the people of Northern Ireland and for the businesses of Northern Ireland. And um, we want to make sure that trade is flowing uh, as freely uh, as possible. And I think I would just take you to the uh, command paper um, where the government itself has said that they're wanting to make sure um, that uh, a lot of this documentation that needs to be produced is going to be done digitally so there'll be no um, additional um, infrastructure that's needed. And in, in the Prime Minister's answer uh, to Sammy Wilson today, he made it very clear there's not going to be any new infrastructure. The uh, command paper uh, repeats the same uh, as well. So um, I think that it's in everybody's interest to make sure um, that, yes, we have legal obligations under the protocol in regards to agri-food and some of the um, uh, measures that were that are going to have to be uh, put in place there, um, but we want to make sure that we minimise friction and we minimise disruption, and um, we're completely united around the executive table in regards to that. Is, is that how you read it, D Declan? Is what, is what? I also think you have to allow for the mixed messages that comes from the British government, uh, and and a confusion between uh, arrangements for border control posts uh, to deal with. Uh, with goods and foods and, uh, and livestock, the issue of uh, customs uh, infrastructure. So in terms of the requirement under the protocol uh, and in relation to the, the SPS elements that need to be provided for, I'm content that the executive and DERA, which is the lead department, is in compliance with the requirements that have been set out by the uh, by the protocol, and uh, that it is working closely with DEFRA and the British government to ensure that those necessary f facilities are put in place. Okay, no, thank you. I mean, that's, 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 pretty, that's pretty clear. Can I just maybe ask a couple of quite pointed questions then? I think uh, it was yourself, Gordon, that covered this one, the Northern Ireland Business Engagement Forum, which uh, it was yourselves that, that took part of that. It, are we going to escalate that in any way um, with 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 others, and I, this sounds awful, but not meant to. With more senior ministers, you know, are we likely to have sort of the minister for economy attending this? Are we likely to have uh, Mr. Poots attending it? Is, is that the likelihood, or is it going to be with yourselves who are going to carry out that forum? And could you give us an idea of who attended that forum? Just give us a, a, a deeper sense of it, please. How very dare you? Are you? Are you, are you, are you trying to <laughs> insinuate someone? Have, I didn't have the words. <laughs> No, well, look, I think, first of all, we'll, what we need to do is distinguish between the engagement that's happening at a UK level and the engagement then that's happening um, at, at the Northern Ireland executive uh, level. And the, um, the government did commit in the command paper to the establishment of a business engagement forum, uh, which would um, meet regularly. And uh, we are there to represent the uh, executive uh, on that. We're very much in listening mode when we're on that. I thought we had a useful first engagement with, with businesses uh, at that time. It really was, I suppose, an overview to, to begin with. And there are further questions that, 
that, that's going to take place. So I think that that's, that's useful. That was promised between the UK government and, the, um, and, and businesses in Northern Ireland. So that's going to continue. Um, but um, I think it's important to note that DERA and, and the Department for the Economy have both established um, stakeholder groups at which um, EU exit issues are, are discussed. Uh, and these will provide another key link into the work of the, of the Business Engagement uh, Forum. Um, the First and Deputy First Minister have actually also um, agreed that they're going to meet um, small groups of stakeholders on key issues. Uh, and I believe actually something along those lines was just signed off on uh, today. So we're going to have that UK, Northern Ireland business um, en engagement. We're also going to have it within departments, and the First and Deputy First Minister will also uh, engage at that level. And I hope those ministers are senior enough for you on that, Doug. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure they are. And just, just a sense of who attended it, uh, the, the meeting, sorry. The, oh, yes. Uh, it, I, I mean, it doesn't have to be detailed, but just a. I have the yeah. list in front of me here, Gordon, and do you have it there, no? I, I have it somewhere, yes, but I'll... <laughs> well, it, was, it, it was a broad-ranging group, and there were two meetings back-to-back, -back, uh, Doug. So just to give you some uh, examples, IOD, the Institute of Directors, Federation of Small Businesses, the Freight Transport Association, NI Food and Drink Association, a number of individual corporations, ASDA, Caterpillar, the NI Chamber, CBI, UFU from a, a, a rural agri-economy point of view, uh, manufacturing NI, and a number of others besides that, both representing sectors or federations and also individual uh, 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 businesses. Gordon's quite right uh, in setting out the, the commitment of the executive and departmental ministers and the, the two joint heads of government mm -hmm. to continue with that engagement. But this process was stipulated as a requirement uh, under the terms of the, uh, the, the command paper. So it was an NIO-sponsored uh, gathering. Uh, and, and I think it was useful, absolutely indispensable. The, the, the criticism that I, I would make, and I made it at the meeting and since, is that I, I thought it was uh, much too high level. It was scant on detail. I got no sense at the meeting that uh, businesses were being given the type of clarity and certainty that they would want. And, and I know subsequently in my follow-up conversations with uh, the, the business uh, sector and various uh, business organisations that they, uh, their expectation of that process was not met. I said at the meeting that we needed to see a significant ramping up and upscaling of that engagement so that, in fact, the kind of answers that businesses and individual businesses and business sectors needed were provided, again, because the clock is ticking on a lot of these issues. So uh, there's a saying in the Irish language, to, to smite lack and hebra, you know, a, 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 a start, a, a half a start is, 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 is OK. Uh, I don't think we hit that uh, that bar. I think there's a lot more work needs to be uh, to be done to ensure that our business community here in the north are properly engaged and that they are content that in fact we've got the shape of the way all of this is going to unfold. So, in fairness, the NIO and uh, the other officials in attendance did give a commitment that they would come back and provide much more detailed information. And, and that's what the business community at this point in time needs. Yeah, and, and, and I think you answered what my next sort of follow-up question was going to be there, and that is, what was their big issue? And I think their big issue is, is always going to be clarity of what's happening next and where we're going to and what it's going to look at when we're in. So clarity is a, is a big thing. I know that the haulage industry is, is having huge concerns in, in regards to this and are looking at clarity as well. So I think that's what you're saying, that there's, a, there's an issue on, on clarity. Um, but can I ask one very one small chair, if you don't mind, please? The the the, the, uh, the rights and dedicated mechanisms, which is an interesting one, because um, citizens' rights I think are extremely important, and um, the Equality Commission uh, and the Human Rights Commission will undertake the scrutiny and monitoring roles um, throughout this process. Could you try and outline how they will do that? You know, will they be just given the papers to scrutinise? What will they be present at meetings? How will they fulfil that function to give a, a proper, independent scrutiny of, of the 
the, the stuff that comes out in regards to rights and the dedicated mechanism? As, as I understand it, Doug, the, the specificity of that is going to be worked out uh, within the context of what's called the Joint Consultative Working Group. Right. So uh, both the Human Rights Commission and the uh, Equality Commission have, have been engaged by the NIO to provide that role, uh, and that's to ensure that uh, the, uh, the requirements under the Withdrawal, Agre uh, Act, the withdrawal Agreement uh, are, are in fact guaranteed to ensure that citizens' rights, the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, are upheld. Uh, the Equality Commission is uh, currently in advanced discussions with the NIO uh, to agree appropriate funding, and then uh, TEO will act as the sponsor for the Equality Commission and, uh, and we'll be involved in ensuring that the, uh, the mechanics of the modalities for payment and also appropriate governance structures are put in place. They are going to begin the recruitment of a dedicated cohort of staff for that role uh, in uh, July next month. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, and Doug was showing us how flattery gets you everywhere in getting answers there. So uh, we'll pass on now to Martina. Thank you. I'll try a bit of flattery and see how that works. Uh, I want to thank thank uh, the both ministers for the presentation. And the last time you were here, that you informed this committee about the establishment of the border control posts and how the British government had already set aside or said it would be setting aside funding for such posts. And I say that in the context of what Sammy Wilson had asked today, because I think what people need to probably hear is the question and then the answer, uh, because he asked specifically about border control posts in Larne, and the British Prime Minister answered him about customs infrastructure. It's like an apple and a banana, two different things. And I, I think people need to try to, to hear uh, and understand this, the difference between that. And we got that from you last time round. So has there been a lead department and a minister been designated yet by the executive you know, to take forward these checks and the border control posts? Yes. And uh, this touches on, I think it was Doug, uh, perhaps, or maybe it was yourself, Colin, raised, raised the question. Uh, I su suggest that you do get these mixed messages coming from within the British administration, and, and I think that's exactly what has happened today. Um, a question around control posts and then an answer in relation to customs, and, and there is a distinction between the two. Uh, but, and I also said it was, it was I think, yourself who asked it was the me. question, Doug. Uh, the, the executive uh, is going to act in full compliance with the requirements of the, the protocol. So, DERA has been uh, identified as the lead department. Um, its uh, current focus is on ensuring that uh, the plans for the, uh, the control posts are going to be ready by the end of June, because that's a, a, a stipulation on behalf of the Commission. This that, month? Yes, that they are in a position to review. Now, in saying that, uh, they, they're starting from a very low base. Uh, in terms of preparation, and the time scales are very challenging to uh, to meet that. Um, but uh, notwithstanding the low base and uh, working with those uh, those time scales, uh, which don't really allow the time necessary to prepare systems and point of entry uh, facilities, uh, the intention is. To, as, as close as possible, meet the terms of the protocol by the, the 1st of January 2021. So do you think will that fulfil the obligations of the protocol, as said out by the EU, that that time frame, given if you're saying starting at a low base, um, do you anticipate then that the obligations of the protocol will be fulfilled? I said low base because it's, it's about preparation. Uh, it's, the, it's, the, yep. it's the lead department and there are logistical and there are capacity issues uh, involved. But I know that they're directly engaged with, uh, DERA is directly engaged with DEFRA. Uh, and uh, as I understand it, there are 
uh, financial commitments available from the British government to assist in ensuring that the necessary facilities and infrastructure is put in place. So that may go some ways to dealing with the, uh, the, the low starting point and the, the capacity issues. But the, the EEC has made clear under the terms of the protocol that they would like to be able to review um, arrangements by the, by the end of this month. But certainly the target is to have the necessary infra infrastructure in place by the end of the year. I think it is important to emphasise as well that, um, you know, absolutely right, there, is no, there isn't going to be any new uh, customs infrastructure. That's important. Um, what we do have to look at is in terms of um, animal issues, and um, obviously some of that already takes place uh, at our ports. But I, it's our job um, to make sure that the uh, government know how important it is to our economy um, that we have the smoothest and freest flow of, of trade, and we we all we all want to see that happen. We want to make sure um, that there aren't going to be any holdups for businesses uh, or, or consumers, and that this is not going to have a, a negative impact uh, on, on jobs either. And again, I would emphasise it's very very clear in the protocol that the EU and the UK have to use their best endeavours uh, in order to ensure that that's ha that happens and the economy uh, of Northern Ireland is protected. So that's what we're all wanting uh, to, to work to work towards as well. And of course, I concur with that. And of course, they have to make their best efforts, uh, efforts, uh, and to do this. But wishes are for Christmas, and we know what was agreed to, and we know the obligations that's put on both the EU and the British government to implement the withdrawal agreement in full. So it's going back to the conversation. Would you that say on that that things aren't necessarily a black and white? That's why there is a joint committee. Um, to, to iron out these issues because it is ultimately for the UK government to implement the protocol uh, and it's not as if it's just a, here's what we should do or, or, or shouldn't do. Um, there's a lot of work still to be done uh, around this issue and we're going to make sure as an executive that our voice is heard and that we're putting forward the concerns and it has to be implemented as the, as the government has said again and again in an appropriate way and yes ab absolutely we have, we have commitments under the, under the protocol and the government have said that they're going to implement that fully, uh, and they're going to do that do that appropriately. Um, but there's still discussion and negotiation going on around that, and we should all work together collectively uh, to make sure that the, the government and the EU uh, know of the potential difficulties that are there, so that we can secure the best outcome for that for our people. And that's what we're all united and, on. And you would also appreciate that the joint committee is informed by the specialist committee that has only met once. And we've ha heard the EU calling on the British government to have another meeting even of the specialist committee so that that information can be fed through into the joint committee. And it's unfortunate that that has only, only met the once. In the command paper from the British government, when we talked about the establishment of the, uh, of the business engagement forum, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what you're hearing in terms of the fuse uh, from the business uh, community, for instance. I had this week just correspondence from the Derry Chamber of Commerce and the businesses associated with that Chamber of Commerce are feeling uninformed, they are feeling um, unprepared, they are telling me that there's an urgency because there is a lack of clarity and there's uh, technical details that, that they want shared with them. They want to understand how unfettered access, unfettered trade is going to operate and they're looking for support and they're looking for understanding and they don't have understanding, they feel unprepared and they feel uninformed. So, And that's the views that I am getting from businesses where I meet them across the north. So I'm wondering um, from your own perspective, Gordon, if you're here in the scene from businesses because, as you have said earlier, the clock is ticking and we know what the form and the shape of the, and people understand, particularly in business, they understand the differentiation between customs officers and custom posts and custom checks and border control posts. And they understand declarations and what they want to know what they're going to face and they don't feel that they are getting enough information are engaged enough in this process. So as to hear from you, from they have met, um, given what, what has been said, um, that it mightn't have been the meeting that many of them had hoped or anticipated, um, if you're getting the same or hearing the same views from businesses. Yeah. Well, first of all, I would say that the meeting was a, was a start. 
Um, and we were obviously involved in that meeting. I haven't had meetings that have involved the departments for the economy and their working groups and, and, and the department for uh, agriculture uh, either, but certainly in, in speaking to, to businesses, it's clear um, that we do need more clarity. Um, the businesses are wanting that and wanting it as soon as possible. Now, it's difficult to give that clarity when it doesn't exist, um, whenever negotiations are ongoing, when there are still issues that need to be uh, ironed out, absolutely. Uh, that's the case. Um, I think that the uh, first meeting of the Business Engagement Forum was, was a start. Um, it, it began the process rather than finished it. And I think that um, those organisations that are part of that uh, have an important role to play in, in making sure that the issues that they are concerned about don't get forgotten about. Um, however, as an executive, we're very keen to, to engage with, with everyone, especially those that maybe feel they don't have anybody directly to, to go to. Perhaps they're not involved in the other departments, working groups, or, or in the business engagement forum. Uh, and certainly, we'd be more than happy to hear representations and, and to engage uh, with them. Businesses, what they desire more than anything else is clarity. Uh, and the sooner the better. And um, if we can help in that process in any way, we'll that certainly do that. That would be helpful, that. I think, for the Dairy Chamber of Commerce to hear that, and I'm um, in other Chamber of Commerce as yep. well, know to come to you, yep. and that, that, that they will at least get listened to and engaged with. You mentioned, uh, Gordon, mm -hmm. when you were talking, uh, or I don't know whether it was Declan, one or other of you have mentioned the common framework, and about, I think, 10, you were told, by the end of the year, that, uh, that that would be agreed, and we had notification last week, actually, we were sitting at 7, and that was the information that we had received. So if we're being told now it's going to be 10, but that's out of 42 common frameworks. Um, so if we're only going to have 10 of the 42 ready by the end of the year, it is trying to understand how the other um, 32 are going to operate and how long it's going to take for all of the 42 common frameworks uh, to be implemented in full, given that we're now, like it's only a quarter of the way we're, we're told uh, that they're going to be implemented by the end of this year. That's, that's concerning, I'm sure it's concerning your well. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's something that officials from the executive office have been involved in and in, in working on. The, the board had identified 10 high priority frameworks uh, essential. Um, like completely understand there's there's, there's further uncertainty uh, in, in, in relation to that, but um, we'll be more than happy to, to provide further information on that as, as soon as we have it. Okay. That, I suppose the message, if I, if I may, Colin, the, the message to our business community here mm -hmm. in the north is that we are as concerned as they about the, the lack of certainty, the lack of clarity around arrangements, what does implementation of the protocol uh, to, to the fullest extent mean? Do we have guarantees in relation to unfettered access on, a, on an east-west basis? Are there ramifications for trade on a north-south basis? There clearly are, uh, but this is a negotiation which is taking place out with the authority of the executive. Uh, much that I would prefer differently it, it, we are not in charge of, of, of this negotiation. This is being led by the, the British government. So to go back to a point raised by Colin in his, his earlier contributions, it is about trying to influence this to the greatest extent possible. But uh, we are handicapped in, in that respect. And I suppose the broader strategic context, which, which all of this needs to be seen, relates to the interdependencies of the the, the future relationship negotiations that are underway. And uh, what we have done both at an official level and a ministerial level throughout is repeatedly and, and emphasised to the British government that uh, the, the inter interdependencies between the future relationship negotiations with the EU, the rest of the world, and then the protocol itself, that needs to be fixed. You have to get that, that synergy clarified. Um, so what I would add is that officials have sought further reassurance that the British government's operational and strategic approach uh, to the, the future relationship negotiation and the protocol take all of those interdependencies into account. But at this point in time, British government officials are not able to provide that reassurance to our officials. And I think that that is characteristic of what we would have shared with you at the last meeting, where since January, 
when myself and Gordon uh, went to Whitehall for uh, the, the, the first uh, meeting which we attended, we raised the need to be fully cited on the full scope and breadth of the approach being taken by the British government to these negotiations. I have to say that has still not been satisfied, and that is a position that would be echoed on a continuous basis by both the Scottish and the Welsh uh, uh, regional administrations. We are part of a broad negotiation framework, but we are not, in fact, being fully informed in relation to its scope, the detail, the planning assumptions that are being adopted, or the, the kind of priorities that the British government are taking forward. And most important in saying all of that, assurance and guarantees that our priorities and our concerns are being properly taken into consideration. We don't have satisfaction on any of those issues. Okay. Thank you very much, Trevor. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for your, your presentation. Um, I, I'm looking at Mr. Sefcevic's report on the Joint Committee. I just want to pick out a couple of bits here, and particularly in the light of the question that Sammy Wilson asked the Prime Minister today, and the typical answer that he got. He, um, he emphasised that the uh, need for urgency for all work streams is paramount, but in particular with regard to the protocol in Ireland and Northern Ireland. He then said we need to move from aspiration to operation and fast. He emphasised this is not. Uh, less diplomatic than usual sort of language. And he said that uh, by the 1st of January, the UK will have to meet all the requirements of the protocol rigorously and effectively, and that includes putting in place all the necessary checks and controls for goods entering Northern Ireland from Great Britain. That includes applying EU rules on customs and sanitary protection. Try to read as much as but it also includes, according to Article 12 of the Protocol, enabling the EU to effectively exercise its right to be present during any activities of the UK authorities related to the implementation and application of the customs provisions of the Protocol. The customs, not in say border control, it says the customs provisions. So how can how can we reconcile that? But maybe we should be asking Boris Johnson. But how, how can we reconcile that? statement with what he said today, that they still, still insist on this nonsense that there won't be any customs infrastructure, given the fact that Sammy Wilson has now identified a site, but we'll probably be told shortly that this is just an extension of the port, it's not really meant to be for customs or some nonsense like that, but there, there's, a, there's such, a, not for the first time, there's such a clear gap between the two positions that I really wonder how this can be bridged if at all, but certainly within the next six months. Perhaps asking us would at least assure you that you'll get an answer uh, <laughs> if, if, if you were perhaps taking the question up with uh, the, the British ministers in charge. You, you might not get uh, much of an answer at all, if any. Uh, Trevor, during that joint committee meeting, and uh, it happened in the previous joint committee meeting, the European Commission uh, Vice President and other representatives made very clear their dissatisfaction at the level of progress that has been made in relation to uh, the British government's requirement to bring forward detailed plans and timetables to meet the requirements of the, uh, the protocol. And that was repeated uh, at the last meeting. Uh, the, the point was made quite uh, clearly that uh, the European Commission have approached this negotiation in good faith, but that that has not been adequately reciprocated by the approach of the, the, the British government. There is a, a clear gulf in terms of the EU's, the European Commission's, expectation and aspiration for implementation of the protocol. And at this point, the British government's ability to deliver on uh, its requirements. Yeah, look, we're, we're not the negotiators here. Um, the protocol the, the is not got at the moment. Um, the protocol is not by our is not our or, or by our, by our design. Um, what I can 
what I have to do, uh, and what we have to do, is, is to look at the command paper, look at what the um, British government um, are, uh, have said that they uh, are going to do, uh, and uh, it's our job to try and ensure that that, that takes place. Get the, those promises that have been that have been delivered on, um, in terms of the, the, the free flow of, of trade, etc. Um, we can we can make the points. We can um, express our, our position. Um, but I suppose we're not, we're not the negotiators in this. Yeah, I'm looking at, at the the British version of a report on the same meeting, which is about 15 percent of the length of the European one. There's no detail on it whatsoever. It, it says the committee took one decision to amend ten minor errors in the withdrawal agreement. That appears to be the only actual decision that was taken at the meeting. But the, the did re, UK did reiterate its commitment to upholding our obligations under the Northern Ireland Protocol. So there again, there's an absolute distance between these two attitudes. I'm not, not going further with that. There's one line in the British report, Mr Gove's report. He took the opportunity to emphasise the UK decision not to extend the transition period. I think we're almost at the point now we have to accept that. But there's two things. The next line says there will be no further opportunities to extend the period. Now, what, what did the, the British government or whoever wrote that report mean by that? Does that mean that once the 1st of July comes, it can't be extended? Or is it a British government restatement of the fact that they won't ask for an extension? I've got a notice that a, a Quite a, quite a heavyweight politician, namely Gavin Robinson, just the other day, didn't, didn't entirely rule out the possibility, however remote, of a further extension. So who's right? Well, I think the first thing I would say is, we, you, you know, I'm sure you've been around long enough in, in politics that you never rule anything out uh, 100%. But I've been um, around too long. As, 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 as Declan has, has said earlier, um, you, you know, looking at what the government have said, uh, it is. It, they've made their position very, very clear. I think that it is in um, the the agreement that any transition uh, extension have to be requested before the, the the first of July. So with six or seven days to go, I would say it's 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 unlikely that that would happen. Now, those things can always be changed, uh, I suppose, and they could um, make amendments to that. How, however, um, it's fairly clear in my mind that nothing will be changed before the first of July anyway. Yeah, I. I would accept that that far, that there won't be any change made between now and uh, next uh, Wednesday. But um, when I say the EU constantly leaving the window open in case we do change our mind, and then I see that line from Mr Gove that there won't be any further opportunities to extend the period, but I still wonder what that means. Does that mean that it's legally ruled out they can't do it? I think he was referring to the meeting that took place on the 15th of June, that that was the last um, opportunity that they would have had, the last meeting that was going to take place before the 1st of July deadline. I, I, I assume I can't, I can't answer on his behalf, Trevor. Fair enough. I also think it's politics, that there is a position which has been adopted politically at this point by the British government. Uh, they've, they've set that out at the Joint Committee. It's been reiterated at the high-level meeting three days later. The European Commission's approach to this negotiation throughout has been to try and create the bandwidth mm. in relation to uh, ensuring that there is a consensus achieved, that there is, a, there is a successful outcome to the negotiation. But uh, if, if I may uh, call my own sense, and I'm not reflecting an executive position in, in saying this, but I, I know that other executive ministers will hold this view. I do think that the alarming thing about the statement on the, uh, at the Joint Committee meeting was that, that that was probably the clearest signal of a political preparedness on behalf of this British administration to, uh, to crash out of Europe with no deal. Thank you for saying that. Um, within a, you, there was a point that was being made there no, that you, okay. you're okay. okay. All right. um, George, you're uh, the uh, only yeah. member that's on by Starleaf at the moment, or other two? Um, oh, is Emma? No, 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 no. Oh, they've all they no, they they weren't when I looked up and they've popped back no. up again. Um, so, um, George, do you have any questions? Not really. Not really. Uh, sure. okay. Maybe uh, not 
observation just yes and, sure. um, from the extension point of view i mean the british british government has made it clear that the 31st that's it you're right but what what is the extension for why is why is many people asking for this extension so at the end of the day, they have to realize that this has gone on and on and on and on for maybe three or four years. And finally, 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 we're ready to go out on the 31st, and that's it. So what, what is the extension actually for? Could I ask the, the two ministers, some one of the ministers, to enlighten me? Yeah, well, George, good, good to hear from you. Uh, I, th I think I picked up most of that. Um, I, I'm, I'm fairly sure I'll not be able to give a joint uh, answer on behalf of the uh, executive office here. So if, if, I'm, if I'm permitted... It's the fir first of two answers to that question. <laughs> <laughs> then you can choose which one you, which one you like. Look, George, it'll, it'll not surprise you that I, that I take a similar view, um, that I believe that the time has come to get on with it. I don't think the issues will change in another six months or another 12 months. Uh, I think we need to, to get on with this. The decision has been made. Um, and I think that um, we, we need that certainty uh, and clarity. And um, I, I think what could what's worse um, all around would be for this to go on continually. And if you say uh, an extension of um, six months, why not an extension of 12 months? Why not another two years? We, we've been here before. And uh, I can tell from the look on the chairman's face that he doesn't uh, agree with me. Uh, on that, but um, I would I would say I'm, I'm of the view um, that the, the issues are not going to change, uh, and now we now we have to get on with it. Now we have to get on with it. But for a completely different view, I will hold over to uh, <laughs> Minister Kearney. Uh, George, the, the the question yeah. is a political question, and uh, you, you and your committee could talk about the politics of that uh, from now to the cows come home. Uh, however, I, I do have a slightly different perspective on it. I, I, I actually think you have to start with the reality, the objective reality, that uh, our business organisations, uh, our, uh, our economic stakeholders, are very frightened about the current level of uh, uncertainty. Business, as you would know, George, uh, depends upon as much certainty and stability as possible. Uh, and at this juncture, that does not exist. So if you come at this question from the perspective of uh, our business community, then an extension to the transition period could and should be used to actually iron out the difficulties that currently exist and to provide the answers and the clarity that is presently absent. But the corollary to that is that you have the political will to then use the space of an extension to deliver on that. And the unanswered question for me is whether this British government, were it to seek an extension, would it be prepared to actually concentrate and to fasten in on the key issues that business requires to get that kind of uh, certainty and clarity. And, and I can't answer that question, but I would benchmark it against the experience of the last period of months. And the last period of months and the preceding periods of engagement between our officials and British officials and British uh, government ministers is that they have significantly shortchanged us in relation to the necessary information data, modelling, projections, planning assumptions that are necessary to actually underpin uh, a negotiation that would secure uh, a good deal at the end of this uh, transition period. Yeah, that, that's your perspective, Jack. Quite honestly, but uh, quite honestly, I, I would just like to see it, you know, the whole thing wrapped up. Let's get on with it. I hear that, George. I, 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 I get other, you know, a few months, maybe after the 31st, if there's other issues that should, should be ironed out, there, there's, there's some that would be plenty of time to iron them out. But let, let's just get on with it. Get, get it. get it over and done. We're gone, and that's it. I, I completely, I completely get that, George, and and of course there's a difference of opinion between us on that point. That's why I, I began by saying, you know, it's it's about the politics of it, but I, I'm moving beyond the politics of it because 
do, do you see the employers that I'm talking to, uh, the small manufacturers, the, uh, the haulage company directors, the, the farmers, uh, people involved in uh, agri-food uh, production? Th those people that I meet and talk to are telling me that they're very, very concerned about their livelihoods and the future of their employees. And that's really my starting point. If those people aren't, con aren't reassuring me that they are content with the direction of travel, then I think that is a big political wake-up call. It needs to be taken as a political wake-up call by, by all of our political representatives. Yeah, I'm sure I'll answer by and out. You can ask the 31st, quite honestly, Declan. But thank you, Andy. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, um, there's two more members online. So, um, Pat, do you have anything that you want to ask or add to? Yes, thank you, uh, and, and thanks to both junior ministers for a fairly comprehensive briefing today. Um, mo most of the queries that I had have been cleared up. Uh, I have one question, I suppose I already know the answer to it, but I I'll ask it anyway. Um, the British government did give a formal commitment in the terms of reference uh, for the Joint Ministerial uh, Committee that uh, they would seek agreement with the uh, devolved administrations in terms of having some influence within the negotiations. Does, does the executive have a view on whether the British government has upheld that commitment? Thank you. Um, I suppose in answer to that question, the government have been clear that um, the negotiations, um, neg any negotiations on international arrangements uh, are the responsibility of the, the UK government. Um, I suppose so far, the negotiations have focused on technical clarifications, but this is the stage now where it moves to a higher level of uh, engagement and talks from next week will move to a more intense phase. Um, the JMCEN structure was set up to give the devolved administrations a, a voice in the negotiations um, and, and those meetings have taken place, there were only two of them um, uh, this year. Um, so I suppose in short this is a matter for the, for the UK government but uh, we want to make sure that our, our voice is, is heard and uh, we continue to do that um, through, through the various structures um, that exist uh, including regular um, meetings and updates with the Paymaster General. I don't know if Declan has anything else to add to that. Other uh, than to add, Pat, that I actually draw out uh, a distinction between the, the quite frequent uh, encounters that are arranged with Penny Mordaunt uh, and some of the officials involved in the negotiations and then the, uh, the bilateral uh, meetings that were uh, promised under the terms of NDNA uh, with Michael Gove. And thus far, we have only had two of those meetings uh, with, with Michael Gove, which generally are, uh, are much more substantive. Uh, he is uh, one of the key, the, the key political authority figures in relation to leading on uh, this negotiation. Uh, I find the, the goodwill shown by uh, Penny Mordaunt to trying to resolve difficulties and answer questions and move things along um, convincing. But uh, I actually don't see any product coming out of, of, of those particular engagements. And I think that there's a twin track approach, therefore, being taken in relation to engagement with ourselves. Uh, the more frequent track of a contact is with Penny Mordaunt, who I think comes to this with genuine goodwill, but I don't see delivery at that end. And that's probably to do with uh, issues in terms of uh, your position in the food chain. Um, and we've only had two meetings. With, uh, with Michael Gove in that time. The reality is that uh, there is a significant impasse at this point in time within the, the negotiation. And, and, and that's why I make the comment about the meetings with the Paymaster General, because I think that's the clearest evidence that there is an impasse and that there is congestion uh, in terms of the approach that the British government is actually 
uh, thinking about or acting out in terms of their, uh, their, their ongoing contact. So our, I said earlier on that uh, we would not be satisfied either at a ministerial or an official level about the, the quality and the substance of the, the communication or indeed our involvement or our, our ability to influence the negotiation. That remains my position, and I think I'm reflecting the position of officials and other ministers in that respect. It's very much a case of uh, not just could do better, but must do better, and as a matter of clear urgency. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Emma, would you have any questions there? Thanks, Chair, and thanks to the junior ministers uh, for the session. Um, I don't really have anything much to add. I think that. Obviously, everything has has been covered, and that, that was a, a good conversation. But I think even the interchange there, uh, following George's question, sort of demonstrates potentially the need for an extension, or why people would want an extension. That there, there is still so much um, that we don't have clarity on. We don't know what way things are, are going to be for so many sectors. And even like last night, I had a conversation uh, with a farmer down close close to home who is just completely confused as to what's going to happen with single farm payment next year and you could you could have an example like that for every industry that there is um i suppose there's a lot of uncertainty now in terms of covid and everything and, and brexit is just another thing that's just looming there um that that people are worried about all the time and have been for a number of years now at this stage but no thank you very much and, and appreciate the presentation okay um that brings us towards the end. I'll maybe end on, uh, on Trevor. Was there something urgent? Uh, yeah, I'll be very quick, Chair. Yes, Thanks if you can. Much. Thank you. I'm, I'm trying to labour the same point indirectly again. But well, the, if you're going to labour the point no, again, can no, we, is it no. something new? Or? Right, I'll, I'll say it in one sentence. The, the government says there will be no customs provisions. The protocol says there will be. And also says that the EU will have the right to have representation at that customs provision. Now, just recently, the British government ruled out the possibility of even having an EU office in Belfast, which might be where EU representatives could be based. I just, I just wonder how far we're going with this. Is there, has there been any discussion on a particular point about EU representation in Northern Ireland following the eventual conclusion of all this? Well, it's not actually a matter for, for the executive. Um, it's ultimately a decision for, for the UK government. The UK government decides how the protocol Suppose is needs to be implemented, and it is it is stated um, that they don't believe that there's a, the need for that physical um, permanent presence uh, in Northern Ireland. That that's their position. Not a good sign. The issue was raised at the first joint committee meeting, oh. and uh, by the uh, the European Commission. Uh, Michael Gove, from memory, uh, in his response, spoke about ensuring that there would be a proportionate implementation of the protocol in response to that issue. Subsequent to that joint committee meeting, then a, a political and publicity controversy blew up around the issue of uh, an EU office in, uh, in the North. And uh, the British government made it very clear that it would not be welcoming and would oppose the installation of, of an office. Now, at the last joint committee meeting, the European Commission made it very clear that they did not see uh, that facility representing a political mission or anything other than a, te a technical office that would allow its officials to ensure that the, the requirements for proper compliance with customs regulations and also oversight of the border control uh, arrangements could in fact be facilitated. And the British government repeated that uh, it, uh, it did not concur, that it did not see itself giving way on that point. And the European Commission expressed dismay at that attitude being, being shown, expressed dismay about the political controversy, expressed dismay at that answer. But consistent with the approach towards all of these issues on the part of the European Commission, uh, sought to leave the door open uh, for a reconsideration of that position expressed. Okay, thanks very much for that. 
Okay, I can end on a trivia question, which is what have the numbers 5, 155 and 164 got in common? And the answer is it's the number of minutes notice that we got from yourselves for today's papers that were tabled in advance of your presentation as we received them around about half eleven and we received one that we couldn't even table today because we got it at five to two. So in the spirit, Junior Minister Kearney, of what you had said at the beginning of making sure that we're going to work closer together and provide the information, can we please get it at a timely uh, time so that we can issue it to members to give consideration of it to discuss it with you? Because if you're going to come this once a month, if we're only going to get some papers a half an hour before the meeting, then we're not going to be able to talk about those papers until a month later. And that just leaves us with the suspicion that you don't want to talk about the contents of it and that you hope that in a month's time, whatever was in the paper will have moved on. So really, there are protocols for the deadlines of papers, and if we could please have them at the appropriate time, it would be most appreciated. Well, could I just say on that, Mr Chairman, there was certainly no intention on our part in any way to deliberately withhold. We're, we've said we're more than open to your questions. We, we welcome this opportunity for engagement. We recognise the role that the committee has. Um, we'll go back to our private offices now to see um, why it was that that, that took place and um, we will endeavour to make sure that that doesn't happen again and that you are informed um, both of um, actions that, that are taken and, and that you get papers in time as well. I'm not sure what the verbal version of cut and paste is for an answer, but we're getting the same answer now for months. So I, I'm taking you at face value. That's also my cut and paste answer back to you. But the patience is running out. But I appreciate that maybe it may not be individually your issue. It may be something within the department. But if you could sort it out, it would be appreciated. Well, we'll do our very best. But uh, the wee reality check and all of this, Colin, as you see, we've sat on that side of the table as well. Yep. So we are former committee members. So we get the need for the circulation of papers, the, uh, the need for members to have the time to reflect, to analyse, to prepare for meetings like this. Uh, we have said to you, and, uh, and it is genuine good faith on our behalf that we want to engage. I think we made the proposal that we were prepared to commit a meeting a month. I have said to you that I'm quite prepared to meet with you informally, offline, off record, just to ensure that there's a regular flow of information. That commitment is intact. Uh, unfortunately, more's the pity, myself and Gordon aren't responsible for preparing all of the paperwork uh, to be made available to, to yourselves. Clearly, there's a glitch in the system. So when we say to you that we will go away and do our very best to resolve that anomaly. That commitment is, uh, is, is, is cast iron. We will go away and speak with our officials to ensure that papers are prepared and brought forward in a more timely fashion from this point onwards in order that these conversations can be more productive as a direct result. But be under no illusion. There's no fast, uh, there's no moves being pulled. There's no strokes being pulled on our behalf. We, we don't work like that. We want to ensure that the scrutiny function of this committee is optimised and we see our responsibility as being about ensuring that you're best equipped to do that and then it's our responsibility to, to do our best to provide additional information and clarity. Okay, Ministers, thank you very much indeed for your attendance today. It's appreciated. Thank you. We'll give you a moment to gather and recover. <laughs> Gather your seniority and get <laughs> exit the room. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Gordon. Thank you. Gordon always brings less papers than <laughs> He's <laughs> much quicker. It looks like you've emptied your handbag. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> See you later on. Okay. That's done. Yeah, that's Okay, members. Uh, yep. I, I just think it's uh, uh, it's reflective of the political system that we're in, and obviously we all have our own different political ideologies and positions. But there's very few, of any MLA that I have spoken uh, that I've spoken to across the political parties that have not expressed a few from businesses who are now running an empty, and the reason why. They are asking for an extension and we're only days away from that door.
door may be closing or that window closing. Is there anything that this committee can do? Because I know from the Chamber of Commerce and Derry, which represents all sections of society, that, that they're very clear that they're running an empty. They have no resources. They have no energy even left after COVID-19, after all that they, they have been dealing with. And they are pleading for an extension, for support, to, because they haven't had time. You know, George was asking, why do we need it? These businesses have been hit with a global pandemic. They haven't time to plan and prepare for what's coming down the track. You know, there's two fat systems going to be in place that they have to learn how to negotiate. Uh, and there could be, there could well be custom posts. There, there's a hope that there may not be. There's a hope that there'll be people will work to try to prevent them. But there could be custom posts. There definitely is going to be border control posts uh, at ports. So is there anything, any common ground in this committee that we can find a way uh, of even having some, whether it be a motion in the chamber or something that would reflect the views of all of the people we collectively represent? Maybe not, because we've asked the questions, we're putting in the questions, I'm sure, to the different ministers, we're doing all, but I feel we've exhausted all the scrutiny that we can do with regards to this particular and whether it's an urgency on Monday or something, because the clock is ticking and we're coming towards this uh, this deadline. Yeah. And maybe as a committee, if we could find a way of doing it collectively together, we should consider that. Well, I know certainly that I appreciate that, that there is politics regarding the extension insofar as I think the extension has become either if you were pro-Brexit, then you don't support the extension, and if you were pro Remain, you want the extension. I have constantly said, COVID. yeah, this is constantly have said at every stage to take the politics out of that. That this is not about the politics; it's about supporting the businesses that are getting absolutely battered, as it is with coronavirus. And then, if they are now hit with another round of regulations and uncertainty in a few months' time, that what would be wrong with asking for six months? or the 12 months to say, let's put it right. It was a point that I had hoped to raise yesterday in an informal meeting with the First and Deputy First Minister that myself and the Chair were due to have. But alas, that turned out a little bit like the reports that we get from them. Uh, at one minute past four, when we were due to have the meeting at four o'clock, we were told that they were unable to meet us. So, you know, we're trying to engage formally. We're trying to engage informally. We're trying to request information which will show that there is a body of evidence that what is going to take place is going to cause problems. But my view is that from the executive office, we just keep getting problem after problem and block after block. And I think you're right. I think we've got, got beyond the point that we as a committee can do anything. We've tried everything. We've written to them. We've brought them here to... to um, well, I'm not going to let you sit there and say it's just with the executive office. It's every you can see we're all different political party. We all come from different political parties, and therefore we have different <laughs> ideologies. There are difficulties, and I'm here, and I think both of the ministers were very genuine today in their mm -hmm. efforts of of trying to resolve some of the blockages. I mean, what you got yesterday in terms of one minute, I find that unacceptable, and I think we would all be on on the same page with regards to that. But we've had, I mean, we've had the the junior ministers in front of us. We've had the joint first ministers in front of us. We've had officials in front of us. We've had opportunities in the floor. We have put in questions. So in it's not because we're getting some kind of a block. I mean, we've all got a different political ideology. But it's to see, is there any common ground for the business sector, for employers, for employees, for all those people that we represent that are not going to be ready on time when we potentially go over a cliff at the end of this year, and they are crying out for some help and some support and some clarity. So it's not just to do with timing of papers or timing of meetings. This is bigger than all of that. Now, maybe there's not. Maybe this committee but, isn't capable of doing anything. This is the Executive Office Committee, so it deals with the Executive Office. This, that's what we do, and we can't interact with the Executive Office because we try to interact with the members and the uh, ministers and they cancel the meeting. When they do come, as you say, to uh, the meetings in, in previous times, we've made the point 
So if we're trying but to... But they be are a, coming to meetings. Yeah. Like we have two ministers but just yeah, walked I out know. the door. Okay, you already have an informal meeting yesterday, but we have two ministers just walked out the door. We've had officials in this room. Yes. These ministers have been here before. We've had the, the joint ministers here. We've had actually good access as a committee. Now, obviously you need that conversation and that communication and that exit yes. too. I appreciate that, but I don't think we should make this about that. I think we have no, something I, I, bigger. I think... Yeah. Uh, if, if, I got, if, if I finish what I'm saying, I think you'll understand it. What I'm saying is when we have them here, we've made the point and it hasn't had an impact. Then we've tried the, the other tact of trying to do it off record because of the, the point that I'm raising that if it's a political issue, well, let's try and make it behind a closed door that it doesn't allow that political, that we don't get caught in the, 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 the stage lights of the politics to try and make the plea there, but we can't get that access. And we've tried it on the floor. So the point you said is, is there something that we can do? I'm running out of things to do because we've tried with ministers formally, we've tried with them informally, we've tried to write to them, we've tried to raise things on the floor of the yeah, assembly. I'm getting the as an exact you're thinking that this is just the ministers or just in the this is across the parties. Yes, but this, this is an executive table. Yes, but but remember this is an executive office committee. So our remit is within the executive office. If you're saying is there something that we can do broader than that? I don't know if that's our position here to lead that, but we should be trying everything. So we should be going back to our parties and making that point. But I don't think it's for the Executive Office Committee to go out and bring together the parties to try and get a solution to that. I think that's well, another place. I'm, but I'm just wondering if, if it is, if there's a possibility from this committee yes. that we can have a motion to calling on the entire executive, which includes your ministers, our ministers, your ministers, all of the ministers. Well, Coming together to discuss, not to your bit of independent at the moment, maybe. I'm a lucky one. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. I don't Please. know if it's possible or not, but can, can we, would it be possible or would it be precedent for the committee to ask the First and Deputy First Minister to make a statement to update us on the current position about uh, leaving or about the transition period? Because next, next Tuesday is actually the last day, it's the 30th of June. And uh, that would be a good opportunity for them to update us. Can we, can we request that? I'm going to defer to the clerk for experience. You mean that. A, a statement. I mean, an oral, oral statement in the house. Oral statement in the house. We can certainly write. We can ask questions. And um, suggest that August. we think it would be helpful. Um, and obviously, then, if if they do that, there will be an opportunity for questions. Yeah, I would have thought they would be, they'd probably be delighted to have the opportunity, seeing everything's been so open and transparent. You know. And is that, again, from experience perspective, is that something that we as a committee can ask the business, or is it the speaker? The, who, who do we ask? The it would be the responsible ministers would um, lay the statement mm. um, and it would get put onto the order papers, you know. But, I mean, there's nothing to stop us writing, you know, to suggest that First Deputy First Minister make a statement um, yeah. on the position, whatever it is. An, an update. An update on. Well, we can certainly, and we, and also we have the first and deputy first minister here next. What, next this Wednesday. day, next Wednesday, they're in on front the of the committee. Day that it's too late. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, if we can, we can write to them again <laughs> and ask that on Tuesday they make a statement about, <laughs> and then we can ask them again on the question when they're here on yeah. on well, um, enough, on Wednesday. Way. But maybe we should write to them to say that whilst next Wednesday I think is originally scheduled as a discussion around COVID, that maybe we would say it's the committee's intention to ask questions also Brexit. relating to Brexit so that they don't turn up next week and we ask a question and they say that's not what we were here to... Mm -hmm. we're, we're not the only members who would like to ask some questions. As Martina rightly says, this is cross-party, cross-community yes. concerns, particularly around the business situation. So a statement in the House would give everybody within reason the opportunity to ask a pointed question. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we can, we so just both. so I'm clear, um, we're going to, the chair is going to write to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister asking that they make an oral statement in the Assembly. Um, and as you say, that would get members from the House to, to ask questions yeah. and to also ask that the briefing that's delivered next week, which is supposed to be on COVID-19 response yes. and perhaps more general departmental issues, that we ask them to expect questions on, yeah, on Brexit. Well, mm -hmm. okay. Just as, as, as an etiquette in terms of them not being able to say at that, well, yeah. you're asking okay. us a question about something that we're not... There, Doug, you wanted to come in? Yeah, no, listen, I, I don't have a problem with this. Uh, uh, Chair, I, I guess 
everybody needs to have the ability to ask questions and express opinions and, and concerns. I think absolutely right. But um, if we're asking them to come in to, to the House to give an oral statement on Tuesday uh, about an extension the day before the extension ends, or we're going to sit here and talk to them about an extent of an extension Over. on the day the extension ends, Over. it's a little bit perfunctory. It's a little bit, we're just going through the motions. I, I, I get that people should absolutely express their concern, um, uh, but I, and that's why I asked the, the very specific question, yeah. does the window close on the 1st of July? And he said it does. I, 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 I don't mind us writing the letter, but what I would say, Chair, you know, notwithstanding what you said yourself, I, I, I think you have done what you can do. Mm. Uh, I think we can raise our concerns, but I'm not sure that it, it will change anything between now and Wednesday I think of next it's week. it's the tempo for increasing the preparations but that yes. we need to. And I think that's what we're talking about coming together about. Because there's six months left and we're being told the preparations is in place. We're also being told there's only going to be 10 of the 42 uh, common frameworks in place. We've been told that the lead responsible department now is agriculture. And yet we can't get any information out of the Agriculture Minister as to what he is doing with regards to border control. If I, can I, if I can know, it's a preparation. Yeah. Business needs clarity, information, all of that. Gotcha. If I, through, the, through the Chair, um, yes, I guess the distinction I'm making is there's no point asking them to come and talk about an extension. Yeah. Yeah. What we're asking them is to come and give us an update, an update on, on, the, on where we are with the whole the thing. And I have no issue with that. But what I don't want to be is, is spending all our time asking about something which is probably... Yes. Well, is there a point then, in, in if next Tuesday is not technically, we haven't breached the date of asking for it, should we write asking that there's an oral statement to the House the following week to detail what additional measures will take place to provide business with support and to detail very clearly how they're going to ramp up through the executive, ramp up and increase the interaction with the business community and the agri-food community and others to make sure that businesses will mitigate against the worst. Especially as we go into potential recess. Yeah. There's going to be four weeks and businesses need to know how they'll be. I, but I, I took heart today from the junior ministers sending a signal, I felt, to the business community to go and talk to them that they're open for business in terms of they're there to listen, to engage, and I know that I'm going to relay that <coughs> to Congress and Dari and encourage them to go and talk to the business community. Well, I think we've, 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 we've got, I think... Sorry, just so I'm absolutely clear, yeah. asking for an oral statement Tuesday week yes. rather than this Tuesday. Why are we waiting for another week? Well, technically next week we haven't breached the date of being able to get the... You know, the, the, for, the sake of argument, the British government could turn around next Tuesday night and say we're going to ask for an extension, and they could turn around on yeah. Wednesday of next week and ask for it. But if we're, if the deadline is midnight of next Tuesday night, it would be odd to bring in the committee and say something that's a done deal by that stage. If we wait six days, seven days, and they can come in and say, well, we've gone beyond the date, yeah. so now what are you going to do? It, it's just the, the order. It wasn't made clear to me, maybe it was to the rest of you, that... that uh, the last day of June is the last day on which we can ask for an extension. Yeah. That's, that's why I asked him about that line in Michael Gove's report. Yeah. And I, I, the impression I got was that we, after the 1st of July, the government could still ask for an, an extension and it would be, such a request would be well received. So I don't see what difference it makes whether we have a statement next Tuesday or the following Tuesday, really. Well, I, th I think technically there is in the withdrawal agreement a date by which an extension, and you can only ask for an extension once, and Europe can't give it, it has to be requested. And the British government has already made it clear that it's not. Um, there's processes as Europe has to be put in place, you know, includes 27 member states that have to be involved in if there is a future relationship, for instance, to sign off and to vote on that. And this has to go then to the European Parliament and all of those other you know, within that time frame, so they have they've agreed. That, now, of course, you know everything's considered uh, in the context of goodwill. If there were a genuine uh, request put in by the British government for an extension, um, but I, I doubt that that's going to happen the day before um, the 31st of of December next year. Like. Just, I just do wonder. I mean. People are still listening to this. Um, the business community will be listening, particularly mm -hmm. to what you said, Martina, and what I've suggested, and they might not completely understand why we'll delay another week before we ask the questions that need to be asked. 
Well, well the, 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 you know, through the chair, we already did as as an assembly call for an extension. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a vote, uh, and it was a majority of those who voted, and they called, we called for an extension. So we've already stated our political preference is to call for an extension. But businesses are feeling there's a lack of clarity. Yes. Yes. They feel uninformed, they feel unprepared, and they don't understand uh, what's happening, and they need to be engaged with it. Okay. I want to bring in George, he's going to viciously comb his hair there, I guess I can see he's waving a comb at us, so uh, George, do you want to uh, come in there? Okay, man. <laughs> yeah, sure, I'm, I'm not trying to be political or anything else, but from Martina's point of view, and I think we, we did hear from both ministers there, junior ministers, that they are more than willing to meet the business community, and I think that's a good step forward uh, on the, you know, to engage their their concerns, the business business community's con con concerns. And she, and she talked about the, the chamber up in <coughs> I would call it London Derry. So, um, and it's good to see that she she has engaged with them. But uh, surely that's reassurance that the, the ministers are more than prepared, you know, to, to meet that body, and iron out maybe whatever difficulties that, that they have. And there should be six months now, you know, between now and the, the end of, of December, to hopefully iron out. You know, most most of their concerns. That's where I'd be. I'm not trying to make it political. No, I think it's like I think we've got we've 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 two options, uh, and the option is that we ask request an oral statement next Tuesday or the Tuesday after. Um, going by what I'm reading in the room, I think there is still an assumption, whether we like it or not, that that next Tuesday that we haven't breached the threshold of the date for which we're asking them. What are you going to do? by that date and I think if we could get them to the house the week after to say the date has passed, now what are you going to do, uh, you know, detail it to us because I fear if we bring them next week they could go through, well, well we don't have the statement, could be well tonight, by midnight tonight there could be, you never know, we don't know, we're not, and it, it just eliminates all of that for the sake of a few days to then say right we have passed that date and therefore you need to be providing additional support and additional uh, uh, work and what is that going to be? And it allows us all to step up and say, what is that support that you're going to provide for business? Because that's the all of us have that as the core. We want to support the businesses and support uh, industry um, and try and get some answers for them and some assurances. So um, I, 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 can I take that as the... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, OK. Right, members, thank you, because that's... As we get closer to deadlines, it does become a bit, uh, a bit more pointed. Okay, we'll move on to e an easier item. Um, oh, actually, no, I haven't even got to the easier item. That's beyond yet. Item five is um, an executive committee functions bill, and uh, we have received some written evidence, which was in the table packs today. It's on page seventy-eight of the table pack, um, and which is item number eleven on the agenda because it was added later on. So. Members, the First and Deputy First Minister are hoping to introduce the Executive Committee Functions <coughs> Bill in the Assembly um, on the 7th of July when it's confirmed. That's not quite confirmed, but that's the intention at this stage. And they're asking for the committee's support for accelerated passage uh, for the bill. Now, this means that there will be no committee stage, which means that we'll not get the opportunity to scrutinise uh, here. Now, the Department's briefing paper sets out the background of the bill and its provision. And as I've mentioned uh, to members, a few of the members, is that this is effectively a bill in response to the judgment in the course case of Buick, um, which was regarding a challenge against decisions that were taken um, by the Permanent Secretary in the absence of the Assembly. Now, under Standing Order 42, the member in charge of a bill must, in advance um, of the bill to the Assembly explain to the committee why accelerated passage is needed, the consequence of the accelerated passage not being granted, and any steps that have been taken to minimise the future use of accelerated passage procedure. Um, so, although there is a briefing paper on the bill in our papers, it doesn't include the explanation from the Executive Office, which is required by standing orders. So a further briefing will therefore have to be provided and will be scheduled for next week's meeting. Um, and again, let's hope that it just sends that message down into the Executive Office that if they have provided us with the right information, we could have approved that today. 
but they didn't provide us with the right information in time, and therefore we can't approve it. So that is just for noting. Item 6 is the formation of government bill, uh, consideration of committee responses. I can refer members to page 213 of the meeting pack, uh, and in particular to page 228 for a summary of the evidence received on the bill, and page 28 of the table papers for the Hansard of the evidence session with the Executive Office and the bill sponsor. Now, in order to avoid duplication of the work being carried out by the concerned committees, the committee agreed to focus only on the scrutiny of those provisions of the bill which apply to the executive officer where there would be a particular duty uh, or obligation. So, just to remind again that this bill belongs effectively to the Committee of Finance. Uh, they are the lead committee and they will conduct the formal clause by clause scrutiny of the bill. The Committee of the Executive Office position and the clauses will help to inform the Committee of Finance, but it will not determine the Committee of Finance's final position. So, essentially, I see two options available to us. Uh, if members wish to come to a view on each of the relevant clauses, um, then we can go through them one by one and have the conversation. Although I will note from the presentations from both the office, uh, executive office officials and from the um, uh, bill sponsor, I got a sense that there may not be a full consensus amongst all members uh, on the various items. And again, reminding members that we simply will be suggesting an opinion uh, to the uh, Finance Committee who will be taking the decision. We do have the two options of providing the evidence that has been given to us along with uh, the uh, suggestion that we were not able to reach a determination one way or other on the various clauses, or we can go through clause by clause and have a conversation on them and decide from there. I'll offer it out them in members' uh, hands as to which way they would like to take that. Chair, would you mind if I come on? Yep. Pat here? Yes, go on ahead, Pat. Well, Chair, I, I think you're right. I think there is disagreement. There will be disagreement within the committee about the way forward on this issue. Uh, I would suggest it would be a complete waste of time for us to sit here today and go through every clause. So I tend to agree with your suggestion that we uh, forward whatever evidence we gathered to the Finance Committee and inform them that we couldn't reach agreement on it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Are there any other views uh, on that? Uh, well, I would agree with, with that. Seems a sensible way forward. We're not going to agree with it. Okay. And then just to, to reiterate then, when it, when it comes to the, uh, the report back into the Assembly, that just we can very quickly report that we, we didn't reach an opinion, but that we can give a, a summary of the evidence that we had received and just present that and allow the debate within the Chamber to carry forward from there. Yeah. So what I'll do for next week's meeting then, um, I prepare a response, draft response for consideration to the Committee for the Executive Office, setting out um, what the Committee agreed at second stage, or prior to second stage, which was that you know the status quo couldn't continue. Um, there needed to be change, but the, there was disagreement over the vehicle or the vehicles in which to do that because there was codes, and then there's the legislation, and also that uh, the committee had agreed not to um, form a view until the RHI report was published. But the RHI report was published um, one working day before second stage, so we were never going to get. So I mean, it'll be it'll be clear in the response what the committee's position was at the second stage. And then what I can do is summarise the evidence that was received from the executive office and the bill sponsor, and then just stating that we don't wish to, or the committee doesn't wish to form a view. Or okay, and again, just to reiterate, you'll bring that for us next, next week. week. So everything that you've mentioned there in, will be in uh, the papers for next week for us to review yeah. and then reach a. A final decision on so are members content then to, <coughs> to deal with the issue in that way yeah okay yeah. um members okay. item seven is um the forward work program if you wish to refer to page 278 of the meeting pack are you content to note that it gives you the details of what we have for the next two weeks and then also uh the first weeks in september for us to progress are members happy to note yep 
Yeah. Yep. Okay, and just also that towards the end of our mid to end of September is our strategic planning, which will first meeting back uh, in September is the strategic planning for the committee for the period ahead. So uh, there be there's less detail about September, but when we come back, we will be able to to determine what we're going to do from September. Um, members, item eight is correspondence. There are ten items. Uh, in the pack, one in the table pack, uh, just to draw your attention to a number of items. Um, item 7.2 on page 285 of the meeting pack is correspondence from the Executive Office uh, regarding the Minority Ethnic Development Fund. We just, we, it, it, what we've received here is an update on what we had received previously, and effectively, that just due to coronavirus, they've been unable to allocate or open their applications this year, so they have uh, introduced a mechanism of putting forward funds um, to the existing groups to help them, and then they will revisit that later. So uh, we're happy to note that. Um, item 7.8 and 3, page 355 of the meeting pack is from the communities regarding issues for uh, social distancing with visual impairment. Uh, individuals, are we happy to note? Department. Oh, sorry, we're to forward that to the department <coughs> for a response. Yes, so if it's from the department of, uh, commun committee of communities to ourselves. If members are ha happy, we'll forward that to the department and ask them to respond. Okay. Happy enough. Um, okay. That's all that I wish to draw the attention in the uh, uh, correspondence. So, are you happy to note the rest of the correspondence that's presented there? Chair, can I? Yes. Can I just raise one I, in the the table pack? Um, correspondence seven point one one. Um, the data breach HIA interim advocates mm -hmm. office. Um, I, I just want to say. I mean, I've, I've got to say, having read it, um, I'm I'm quite disappointed by um, the 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 inquiry or the report, because it only has one objective, and that is to find out how the breach happened. But what it hasn't highlighted is what should have happened once that breach did take place. And I remember, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, we asked the, 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 the First and Deputy First Minister for a copy of the protocol or the actions on what would happen on a data breach. We haven't got that yet, and this report doesn't look at what happens once there is a data breach? Because that, to us, is, is is one of the big issues. I mean, you know, the data breach. I mean, I could have done this. You know, that is somebody accidentally put it into the the, the CC instead of the BCC. <laughs> you know, that's that's pretty straightforward. And, and you know, um, but the actions. What happened when there was a data breach on the Friday? And people were getting emails saying, if you have any issues with it, get us contact with us after the bank holiday on the Tuesday. That, to me, is the bigger issue, and this has not touched it whatsoever. Um, so I would ask, if possible, if we could have that protocol of what should have happened on that data breach, please. Yes, I, I mean, the, the letter issued requesting copies of the protocol. I think there was something else, perhaps. <coughs> if we can um, issue a, a reminder to the department that that's outstanding. Well, it is, because it, because it complements this yeah, in, yeah. in many ways. And, okay. and it was also um, asked for on the floor of the Assembly as well. Yeah. Um, and okay. it hasn't been received. Can I raise another? Mm -hmm. sure. uh, it was 7.5. You'll see a letter from the correspondence from the Committee of the Economy. Mm -hmm. And they sent it's in relation to the hardship funds. Mm -hmm. And I think we should welcome this. Um, I'm assuming just listening to comments from from members, not just here, but on the floor. Uh, this is in relation to any underspend of schemes <coughs> when the hardship fund. Particularly, we're looking at the self-employed sole traders and for, for social, social enterprises and people who feel in organisations have feel left behind uh, throughout this pandemic that they didn't get that support. And I know that the Minister for... Uh, the economy was in with the committee for the economy last week, and she had indicated that the hardship fund um, was was once it was approved by the executive, that it's going to require executive approval uh, to change the criteria. And I think we should support the letter from the committee of the economy that has gone to the uh, to both Arlene and Michelle. Okay, we can do that. Yep, happy enough. Okay, so um, 
Hi, I'm Ryan, it's Chairman's Business. There's nothing there uh, for me to update on. Item 10, any other business? Uh, well then, in that case, we can, uh, we're going to just go into the uh, closed session. So we'll, uh, publicly, the next meeting will be next Wednesday at the usual time. And in that, we will go into closed session. Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.